Hi, hi, hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi, hi everybody. Say hello. Hello. Um, how many of you guys were with us yesterday? Oh, you, of you. Okay. Doesn't count. They're our husbands. They were with us last week. That doesn't. No, I'm not counting them. I'm not counting them. So, and I remember the guy with that. I like that hat. So I remember that. Okay. So let's do it. What we did yesterday is we did a, a really quick uh, introduction of who we are and how we're related to a writing person. Okay. And then we started with just um, questions from the audience. And I think we should do that again, maybe. I do. Because yeah, y'all had a lot of questions left. Um, the ones that were here. Okay, I'm the moderator. I'm Sharon Rice Weber. I'm married to a little guy named David Weber who is in the military science fiction. He has roughly a hundred books out. He's been writing for way too many years now. Um, he's getting old. Um, we have been married for 25 years in April. We have three children, twin girls who were born in Cambodia and who were 21. Our son is active military Marine Corps. Uh, thank you. Actually, Urah. Urah, thank you. Uh, um, I was waiting for it. I gave it to you yesterday. I was <coughs> hoping you'd do it today. Um, he is currently stationed in the embassy in Jerusalem. It's his first duty station, so I'm a little proud. I uh, met David before his first book was out. I probably bought his first book ever. I gave him his first autographing because at that point in time in my life, I was working in a bookstore. Um, and I got him invited to his first convention and invited back to his first convention after they met him. So um, so I was there from the beginning of the ride, so all the way through. This is Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Yanez. My husband's Jonathan Yanez. He writes sci-fi and fantasy books. Um, he's written about 50 books over the last uh, eight to 10 years, and we've recently gone into film production. So we have one short film as a pilot or proof of concept completed and um, shopping, and then we are in development for a new feature length. We have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, um, and I homeschool the six-year-old in the mornings, and um, my husband just said in the panel we were in, he wants to get as big as Marvel movies, and uh, I need another cup of coffee after that. So, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> strapping in for the ride for the big ideas that are the authors. I am Sandy Rothman. I have also been there since before the beginning. He just was a simple little hobbyist. He just wanted to write for fun. And then he got best-selling author, and now he's an author of 20 plus books. And this ride has been up and down, up and down, but the ups are a lot better than, and it's just wonderful. We have kids that our first book was based on a story he told them when they were little and that's the book that got him started that was a fantasy book but now Mike oh Michael e. Rothman he's now sci-fi he's a science guy um that sounds weird being a teacher because he's anyway he's not so nine no so anyway <laughs> so I'm really proud to be his wife I his hard work and his ethics because you have to be a hard worker but you, your children just grow up seeing that, and it's pretty, it's exciting. So we have a 19-year-old, almost 20, and a 21-year-old, and they get to be along for the ride as well. I'm Bridget Correa. I'm married to Larry Correa. He's a New York Times bestselling novelist, um, mostly, what would you say, urban fantasy, some science fiction, a few things. Um, we've been married for coming on 25 years. We have four children, 22, 20, 18 and a 10 year old and the 10 year old is mini Larry so it presents some <laughs> exciting new opportunities of growth and development and um, I'm coming at this more from a traditional published author background so that's that's more of the support that I'm able to give um, mostly we haven't wanted to kill each other a lot during that that time period uh, he started out as an accountant and uh, started writing novels I'm gonna get I'm gonna get zinc because I don't even know when he started writing books. But we had already been married for 15 ish years, give or take, when he started his career. So, I mean, I hate to say I've been here from the beginning because what even is the beginning? Mm -hmm. But here we are. Uh, I'm Blake Hudson. I'm married to uh, Stephanie Hudson, best selling author. Um, I married Steph when she was, well, I met Steph when she was already pretty well successful. Um, We've been married eight years, uh, together nine, three children, 
became six and three. Um, for most of that time, I was a stay-at-home dad, and then progressed into being a writer myself and starting a publishing small indie publishing house, Livestead. Um, yeah. Where are you guys based? We're from the UK, but we live in Spain. In Spain. <coughs> I wondered. I know where the ladies are all from, but I, I, I knew that you were from the UK, but I wasn't sure where you were based there. So. Like okay, so um, we went over some stuff yesterday, and <coughs> if you hit a question that we hit yesterday, we might short answer it, but does anybody have a question? No? Short, short panel. panel. Okay, thank you for coming. Right. For coming. Just, just remember, you need to be the brave one to ask the question, because Somebody else in this room has that same exact question. I yeah. tell my students that all the time. Be that brave person because you're going to have questions. Okay. So do you have any strategies to help like when your author spouse hits a writing block? Right? They just yes, can't write shoot them at that point. Find <laughs> <laughs> something to do outside of the house. Yeah, get out. Yeah, um, I'm just kidding. I, I, think, I think every writer is going to hit that chapter, that book, whatever. And sometimes you can you can you can you can be there and be supportive, and really talk them down through it. Um, but it's something that they've got to work out themselves. Okay. And there's a limit to what you can do to help them do that. Now I have uh, actually um, back when David and I were first you know first four or five years of marriage, he was working on a book that was not working, and I know that y'all have all been there. It wasn't working, it wasn't working, it wasn't working. He was, he was flinging himself against this book over and over again, over again. And finally to the point, I called his publisher and I said, this ain't working and he's not listening to me. Can you talk to him and see what you can do? You know? And he, he, they, they wound up scrapping the book. They kind of went back and he rewrote parts of it and you know, he filed off the serial numbers and changed a few things and put it into another one. But, because it just, he, he wasn't making the technology either advanced enough or not advanced enough because I don't remember now if it was a sequel or, or a later book in the series. But okay. um, sometimes you have to intervene and sometimes you have to be sneaky about it. But <laughs> it, it's, up to, it's up to you, you know the help of your, your writer and taking that in initiative sometimes is, is uh, not easy and it's not fun and you will probably get ringed out for it at least in the in the short term, maybe not the long term. I've also put my foot down that, okay, you've written your last book with that particular collaborator because I'm not putting my kids and my family and you through this again. Okay. So that's... Also, you know. another thing, are they having fun outside of writing? Because there needs to be a disconnect sometimes from the intensity of the creative process in one direction and pivot into another <coughs> direction, whether that be going to see a movie or my husband likes to do mini painting mm -hmm. because it disengages that part one part of his brain and engages it somewhere else and it has been very helpful for him in my observation for him to walk away from it for a little bit mm -hmm. and maybe focus on something else because sometimes the problem will solve itself or the inspiration and will sometimes get. just using you as a sounding or like are they yeah. le are they leaving the office whatever the office is yeah. for us it's our home because yeah. we both work from home and so sometimes we have to get out of the office right. and go get dinner or go away for a weekend just to change the scenery to sort of break that whatever the block is. Okay. Sandy, you were saying? Oh, I just have two things. One was just a funny thing. Find out their favorite candy. And just be <laughs> that. Sugar buzz. Sugar <laughs> buzz are great. Well, it's not just candy. It's just this will make him smile. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing about getting out, we've decided with a little help that every two weeks we have a date night. Mm -hmm. And I, we love it, but it's nice because it gets him out of his writing process. Because if we're home, there's no reason other than when he's cooking, he's right. Well, no, he sleeps a little bit, but he's <laughs> writing if he's not cooking. Okay. See, my, wife, my wife makes me write a thousand words to get a piece of candy. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't count his words. Ooh. I know he writes two thousand or more, but I don't count his words. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm in a different situation where my husband doesn't believe in writer's block. Uh, he says, sit down, <coughs> write the words out, tell a story if you need to go back and make edits. 
that's fine. Keep going because maybe what you need to do is get the bad stuff out or work out the story that is not what the story needs to be or at least get it out and you may be surprised to find out what it is. He gets eight to nine hours of sleep every night. He has the same schedule every day. He hits his word count um, just about every day. We, I guess we have a two and six year old, so you know there are realities. Um, but we are very routine and regimented. And so if I see physically he's not performing well or he has a little bit of agitation, are you eating the right foods? Are you getting the sunlight you need? Did you make it to the gym five times this week or four times this week? He works out all the time. She's a better woman so, than I am. So, <laughs> well, I, I'm I can't get David that, to do anything. Like, well, so. well, he, he, he doesn't need me to manage him. He manages himself, and he, that's how he's gotten to where we are. But I'm encouraging him and reminding him of the things that are important for him. And so if that's the case, and it may be like, hey, you've been really ingrained. I know you had a release that came out last week, or you did a rapid release, or whatever it is. So you've been messaging and coordinating with the newsletter swaps, and the readers are messaging you, or the narrator, et cetera, et cetera. I'll do the same thing. We need a change of environment. Hey, I got to go get some, you know, our daughter. That was one of the things that stood out to me, is I kind of was like, you need to come with us to the dance store to get our daughter's first pair of ballet shoes. It was something small. I could have easily done that by myself. I did not need any help. However, what it took for him was that change of moment. It opened up his mind, and it's kind of physiological, right? Because if you are in a stress state, your body's more thinking about survival than it is being creative. You're not trying to be creative to get rid of a raven saber tooth tiger. You're thinking fight or flight. So, but taking him into a different environment and then reminding him of some of just the beauties and simplicities of life. It was just able to like, all right, you're too deep in it. Take a step back and uh, go back to it. Go go do what you gotta do. Um, hit it again at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning and yeah. then go from there. Before, before Blake answers this, I know David was fussing because there's been a couple of writers that we've known through the years who get writer's block and they don't write for years. One of them is yes, who you're thinking about too, okay? Um, and he's always said, take their credit card away from them. Because of the realities of if you want to eat next week, you have to write and turn a book in this week. You know, when that reality is <laughs> you know, if you want your children to eat next week, then you, you will write the damn book. You know, you'll get it in. That's one of David's things is take their credit cards away from them. So, um, like, yeah, so I, I, I'm probably coming from a slightly different perspective in that, that my wife doesn't really get writer's block. She's got a problem where she can't stop writing. Um, but she does get through periods where she's not quite sure how a scene's going to work or how the next chapter is going to play out, and she gets fixated on. If you don't get her out of the house, she's she's just going to sit there until she finishes it. Um, so so being that sounding board, so okay, tell me about where what you're up to so far. Where do you want it to go? <coughs> time, I'm not really saying anything to her other than nodding and going, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, and. She will have worked it out, and then she'll be happy. But also, you do, you've got to go and make time to get them away, mm -hmm. especially if they're prolific writers. You just don't, they just want to be away from night and night and night. Um, it's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the main mm -hmm. Did that answer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Or, yeah. That's one of the. What's one of uh, really good ways to keep your writer on point? do not have that problem. Uh, I wish. No, like uh, keeping them focused on working. I mean, do they want to do this? Do no, they my, do that? Is that what you mean? No, my wife is like squirrel. Jesus. She sees something like squirrel and then moves to something else. And then she moves to something oh, else. And then moves to something else. Well, I, I, my husband gets into programming, like computer programming. He starts writing programs instead of writing the book. So, so I think it goes back to what Sharon was saying. Yeah. saying do they want to do this? And yeah. is this? Is this what they want to do? We're not they babysitters, do <laughs> right? We're not babysitters. We're just yeah. support. We're spouse. We're equal. How would we address it if they weren't doing their job at they, work? If they were you know, getting fired from their job and not yeah, Because they're not performing. Right. So it's like, yeah. if you want to do this, do it. And if you don't want to do this, stop wasting everybody's yeah, time. Do something else. Yeah. And if they need help, you know, we had an author friend that worked with him. He found out because he couldn't hit his work count. I'm like, what's going on? And he began to ask those questions. What is going on? And he got tested. He found he had ADHD, severe, is undiagnosed. So he, for himself, he got the care he needed. Someone else says, I have to shut down all my programs and disconnect from the internet, so I'm not tempted. 
know yourself, know your Find what works for you or your writer. Yeah. And also what? if you're in a, let's say, an early stage of, of a writing career where, you know, maybe you both still work or maybe the one is the main breadwinner and maybe the main breadwinner is the one who wants to be a writer. Well, obviously, you know, their responsibility is they're going to, they can't stop being the main breadwinner until their writing career makes them the main breadwinner or vice versa. Or you go through the starving artist phase and, yeah, and, and uh, you know, you, you, you got a happy that. medium in there. David likes to say that a, a true writer is like a, a, like a rabbit. Their teeth will keep growing until it goes through their brain. If they're not at the keyboard and writing those words or getting them down and getting them out of their head and on the paper, uh, then they will go crazy. You know, it's just, and, but you've got to figure out, is your writer a real you of writer? Uh, is it a hobby or is it this, you know, is this what they really want to do with their lives? And if it's not, nobody can make that decision except them. You know, maybe we will help an input from you. And frankly, but, there's you know, nothing wrong with it being and a hobby. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, it's yeah, just, you yeah. know, but maybe their creative thing is something else. It's a hobby. So. And that this is the side hustle that they enjoy doing, and but they're still really going to be, yeah. a, you know, whatever it is. We have uh, one of David's co authors, uh, Jacob Hollywood, um, has a full time job. He takes <laughs> a vacation, uh, you know, he gets like six weeks a year, I think, because he's been with the company forever. And he takes them in two week chunks and he writes for those entire two weeks. Mm -hmm. And he writes on the weekends, he writes at nights, but he takes those vacations and he, he you know, he'll turn out 20 hour days uh, for two weeks. And then, you know, and during that time he, he can put out two, you know, two, two short books. David writes like boat acres, okay? So really big, big books. Mm -hmm. Jacob's are shorter and, you know, and he published. So, um, you know, so find that, Whatever that itch is that works for you. If if it's if it's writing the little books and you write on vacation and you know on the weekends and stuff, then you make that work for you. Oh, also, there's nothing wrong with the throw the spaghetti against the wall method. Sure. Like if it doesn't stick, that's okay. Try something else. Mm -hmm. Like you're not a failure because something that you tried didn't work out the first time. Just try something different. Try a different method. Mm -hmm. It's it's a process <coughs> where you're hopefully always moving forward and figuring things out instead of doing the same thing over and over and over again that doesn't work and being frustrated. No, oh, that's insanity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, was there another question? Did we answer the question? I guess this is the question. Okay, do you got a question? Actually, do. How many of your writers publish as well? Other people. Oh, other. people. Okay, what do you do when the writing balance and the publishing balance starts to queue to publishing and they start losing their mind? Say that again, sorry? What do you do when the balance shifts more to publish than writing and they start losing their mind? <laughs> well, the main focus is Steph's writing, so she always puts that, from a business point of view, she always puts that first. Mm -hmm. So, from, and that's why I'm part of the publishing house as an equal and then we have a team of people so I'll never I will never take away from Steph's writing to run the business the business comes second but we have other people to make our authors feel valued so it's, it's you know she's not always spending one-on-one -on -one time with people so that's how we balance it out I, I think it's kind of like um, anything else that you're you're trying to balance writing with whether it's another full-time job or family life or whatever, you know, that balance has got to be what's what's making your money, what's bringing your money into your, you know, what's going to keep your family up and running. Mm -hmm. um, is the publishing side of the house making the money? If it is, then maybe put that first for a while. If it's the writing, you know, I know you know Chris and Sheila mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy, you know, is it the writing that's making the money or is it the publishing side of the house? Is it the real job in the real world, or is it, you know, the... I think in this case, it's just a shift, because she started picking up the publishing of the group of people that she's And for a while, maybe with, that needs to be the focus, yeah. so, you know, maybe that does need to be the yeah. focus for a little bit, to get it off the ground and get it going. But, but uh, if you're talking about 40, you know... Like, I should be writing, and I'm like... For writing, yeah, writing. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it depends, what are you supporting? What is it, what is your job in this relationship? Is it to support your writer or to support the publishing house? You know, and that—that's again, that's what you've got to figure out. And 
betwixt the two of you. I was gonna say, it's also a conversation about what are your priorities? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, is it your job that's making the money to pay the bills and put your kids through college? Or is it your writing? Well, guess what? If it's both, then you have to work harder. You have to work as hard as possible to do both of it, both of them. But it's really important that you communicate your priorities and that you have the, um, pri your priorities are the same. I think open communications, I think, is, is, is beyond, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it, in any relationship, open communications is important. But when you're working out of the house, and it sounds like most of us are working mm -hmm. you know, out of the house, you're with that person 24-7. A no, lot I of get times. to leave. I get to leave. You do get to leave. I, 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 I hate you for that saying, but, but but I mean seriously, you know, if you're if you're if you're there in the job, if you're doing you know, uh, whatever you do to support that that writer, and it may be as simple, and I use that term creatively, as taking care of the kids, so mm -hmm. that your spouse, your writing partner, isn't having to do that. They have the freedom to not have to deal with the kids for you know. 10 hours a day so they can write. Um, but that communication skills, and that's an art form all by itself. And this um, is a little preemptive because nobody's asked this question, but I think it's very, very, very helpful outside of the writing realm, just with your partner having almost like a mission statement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is, like for us, we call it Team Korea in it to win it. If he's not happy, then I'm really not happy either. And if I'm not happy, he's not really happy either. We, we don't win unless both of us is winning. And we have had conversations that feel almost like, you know, those like therapy projects of where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah. Where do you, like, what do you yeah. prioritize first right now? And that, that changes depending on where we're at with our, with our kids, with our parents, with, you know, what, what's going on in the world around us. But I think it's really helpful just generally to have those conversations of what is our priority so that you can remind each other and remind yourself that like, hey, I don't, like for Larry and I, I don't really care if he is the world's best author. I want us to have a happy, healthy marriage. Mm -hmm. I want our kids to be okay. And so that is our priority. And conveniently, everything else sort of figures out and falls into place that helps him to be successful as a writer because of that. But I think that that's just generally a good thing to do, particularly if you are sort of evolving and figuring out these new sticky situations of, okay, well, now they're spending all this time and I've got more of a workload that I never had to shoulder before. Okay, but what is our priority? How do we how do we make this work within the priorities that we've set out independent of the writing world? Mm -hmm. And you being here is huge. The fact that you're here shows them you want to support them right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, do you read all of your writers? No. no. Oh, no. I, haven't, I haven't read so any so. of Larry's stuff. Do you know? None of Larry's stuff. I wasn't on this panel last year. I was sitting right there. And the first thing that made the world come together for me as a support spouse was these ladies said no, they don't no. read no. any of them. I was like, so I read one a year oh, and know. I'm good. <laughs> and it was because I can read so one in the summer. If you're like the marketing manager, how do you market a book that you don't read? See, that's a problem that I don't have, but <laughs> uh, yeah, we do yeah. like and I yeah. do marketing, but you don't need to know the intricate no. details no. of what's transpiring in a book to communicate, to communicate its thesis, yeah. you know, or its plot. The blurb does that, right? The blurb is just like the distilled synopsis. You've had enough conversations about those characters at dinner tables, dinner tables or, yes. you know, as they're like ideating aloud for you to know. And it's based on, depending, you know, what they're doing, it's kind of based on certain tropes. So you just kind of plug and play yeah. with that. But the only time I listen to his books anymore, even as I said listen to, is if I'm seeing the audio because we produce audio on some of our books. So if I'm quality control checking those things, then I'll hear the stories, and then it's a lot of fun for us to laugh together over some of the yeah. things that were there. I have to say, before I, I knew I knew David for about seven years before we married. 
Um, and, and yeah, I read the first couple of three, five, seven, 12, whatever. And, and I enjoyed them. I'm one of these people though that I have to read, reread the entire series when the new book comes out for, you know, when you've got 20, 30 books into a series, then no, yeah, I don't, I just, I have a life. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and then but, it makes you feel guilty. Not yeah, don't make it. Don't, don't let it don't hit let that. It so, because, um, you know, it's not. It, it's it's impossible to keep up with it, and there wouldn't be companies out there advertising other people's books or offering services to do that if they had to read everybody's book to advertise it because yeah. they just wouldn't have time. To don't do feel guilty about it because because, okay. like Jennifer said, you know, you're you're talking about it at a dinner table. Now I do uh, occasionally we'll get a, a scene or something. David will see. You know, is this working? Is am I getting across? Whatever. Oh, I made you. I made Sharon cry. Yes, therefore, yes. it's yeah. Therefore, it's it's solid. It's <laughs> it's doing what I wanted to do. Okay. So yes, there's there's parts of it, and we do talk about it. There's been the, I I can't tell you how many. Uh, oh, what would happen if you did this in that scene? That winds up in the book. I will never get credit for that, but yes, my you know my <laughs> two cents is in there. I don't even do that. You know, I I, that. well I I you know we do. But, um, and I think it, it, it kind of goes back to uh, if, if it's your genre and it's what you read and you like it, read it. If you don't want to read it, don't read it. Don't feel guilty about not reading well, it. So. And if you do read it, be careful of the critiques. Oh, no, but be honest. But be honest. That's the other thing is be honest though because if, it, you know, if something's not working um, and you play it off that it is working and then, and then the book it's doesn't do mean. well, yeah, but, but, but it goes both directions. Right. It goes both directions. Because if the book doesn't go well, then it's, it's, it's kind of coming back on you a little bit. Because if you like it and it, it's working for you, it's probably going to work for you know everybody well, I, else I, I in the audience. Do, I, would, so. I would counter argue with that, that you could be thinking it's the best thing since sliced bread. And it could be a load of rubbish. You know, or, you, but, and that's what I'm saying. Okay. It's, 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 you know, with I yourself just, as well. Because I, kind of, another thing I want to clarify. Go ahead. Go I ahead. just want to clarify. When I was reading his book this summer, I didn't understand anything in chapter two. It was so science oriented, the vocabulary, but I stuck it out because yeah. I wanted to. The rest of the book was incredible. Well, his readership is science, science based. People, yeah. So they're going to love it. So critiquing him on that. Wouldn't have helped. But bringing yeah, it to his I attention that, it, that it's not oh, gonna, the average reader is not going to, you know, David used the word flins in, in one of his very first books. And what it means is to, is to <coughs> cut the skin off of, like when you're skinning an animal, to flins the skin off. It is not the average reader's vocabulary. So you also have to keep that in mind because if you're doing science fiction and fantasy or, you know, or, you know, techno thrillers perhaps. There's going to be a certain level of, of expertise that the readership is going to have that the average summer beach bunny at the beach reading a you know is not going to have. Plus, so you kind of have to kind of throw that in. Coming at this from a very 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 different angle, I don't read Larry's stuff because there needs to be a separation of church and state mm -hmm. in our lives of. His curve, like I have a life, mm -hmm. I have interests well, yeah. to be so. that, well, it's not even about doormats. It's about, I just have things that I like that he has no <laughs> interest in whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I need to have space in my own brain, not filled up with his, his, his stuff, his yeah. stuff because yeah. it can mm -hmm. really start to overshadow my own creative mm -hmm. endeavors and just the things I that have, I'm I have certain So I have to have that barrier just for me. And, and I think in the beginning it really kind of offended him that I didn't read his stuff, and I would try to explain it, and you know, we were coming at it like this. But I, I just I needed the space to not be at like so consumed. My husband, my, my husband has an uh, has a has a, a mistress, and it's his computer, okay, and the oh, books that he writes. Yeah, you know, that, he spends more that's, time with him than than that's anything. That's a great point. Yeah, you know, it's it's that the, it's the other woman in the in the whether, relationship. Whether it's okay. writing or any other business any, any that other your business. partner's into, there is also that point where they shouldn't work all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. not all about his job or their her right. job. Mm -hmm. And I have I have writers that I love Larry stuff. I love Larry stuff. I love uh, Carolyn Cherry, CJ uh, Cherry, um, and I will buy their books hardcover and and devour it in five minutes. But I won't I won't go back and read uh, David's stuff. Now that's not to say that I don't have favorites of, of the stuff that I have read, 
and I will promote those. Um, but reading all of it, no. I think um, what Bridget was saying is a good point too. Is sometimes Jonathan and I will go out because it is, can be all consuming. Like mm -hmm. you were saying about like the rabbit who has to, they have to nod and they have yep. to get mm -hmm. those stories out. Um, and you know, he's all consumed with it because in between his writing sprints, he's emailing, he's talking to a reader, he's talking to other authors. But if we're going out, there will be times when I'll say, this is a date. Yes. This is not a business meeting. That's right. Okay. And I until I was able to communicate that and, and, and it felt like I was being dismissive of the things he wanted to talk about mm -hmm. or not prioritizing um, because we work very differently. So even though we were both working on the business, we each have our lanes. He wanted to talk about the crossover, the handoff, and I wouldn't want to talk about it. I don't need to hash stuff out. Give me my orders, I know what I need to do, I'll come up with my own orders. That's it. We don't need to talk about it. You should drive my former boss crazy. But with my husband, I can set more of those boundaries and say, I got it. But do we need to schedule a business meeting? Let's you know, get the nanny in and let's go take off for lunch. We'll have lunch and we can have these conversations and hash them out. And then we also have to taper that kind of stuff when it comes to the dinner table. To a six-year-old, they are sponges. So when our daughter starts playing pretend with her authors and her audio books, and, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she, you know, that is fun because they, they, kids get to grow up in a very different world, right, than, than typical with mom and dad leaving the house. Um, but I want her to do more with her unicorns and her kitties and her mermaids and Narnia and, you know, Hobbiton and all of those wonderful things um, in space. So it has to be a balance now, even at the dinner table, like, you know, directing the conversation and bringing just awareness to it. They're in the weeds, they don't know. So but bringing in a loving, supporting manner, awareness to it. Um, so you can also see or she can see how it's affected yeah, the family at large. Not. You know, yeah, and it's to win it. And you, yeah, your poor children. <laughs> okay. We have about 13 minutes left. Do we have any other questions? Is this helping? Are we just rambling? <laughs> she stop time for writing, so yes. <laughs> An especially stubborn writer from burning out. You can't. You can't. You have to take that out of your vocabulary, your thoughts. How can you fix them? It's kind of like in a marriage. You can't change them. Okay, there are techniques that no, you can. There, there, are, there are techniques. Like, okay. Do I, you want? But do oh, you want to take it on yourself? No. You can, but no. Because okay, like like David, David was David will go and write for twenty hours if I let him. Okay, I don't cook deliberately. So shut up, Dave. Um, I don't cook. Okay, and when the kids were little, okay, uh, we our separation of church and state is I had to get his office out of the house. Okay, I did not want him anywhere that he could hear anything that went on in the house. If he heard the kids crying, he was always, what's wrong? You know, I was like, no, you don't need, I'll take care of the children, you go work, okay. So we had to get him on the other side of the swimming pool, separate building, separate everything, okay. Go out, go away. However, getting him back into the house and getting reconnected to the family mm -hmm. at times can be difficult, okay. So what I would do is I would use two of my little uh, special weapons, which was called Megan and Morgan. And when they were especially you know, young, go tell dad it's time to come in for dinner. I don't cook, dad cooks. Dad would spend one night a week with each of the kids, he would rotate, okay? And when he was cooking, he would talk to them and they would have their their one-on-one, -on -one, you know, dad, dad kid time, okay? And that was, and mom wasn't anywhere around, nobody else was around, the other kids were in their rooms playing. It was just, he got to spend that hour cooking and then that hour at the dinner table with the kids. And if, if, the, if he was out in the office and he lost track of time, which he loses track of weeks, months, <laughs> years, occasionally what day of the, you know, what, what day of the millennium it is. And I would say, you know, okay, Megan, it's time, you know, it's your day today for to go get dad. Go get dad, y'all come in, y'all fix dinner. Tell us what we're having, you know, let us know when dinner's ready. And, and, and that would pull him back out of that, okay? Sometimes you have to do that. Also, yeah. I think it's important to maybe try and find out why they're burning the candle at both ends because we've had conversations that it's, are you worried about the finances? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about the schedule? Are you feeling the pressure because there's too much? What do we need? Because that for us has been a little helpful in 
okay, well, if you're worried that there's too much going on, then we need to bow out of some conventions, bow out of maybe a project. We need to structure into our schedule so that you feel comfortable with it. So when you're sort of getting spun up, we can look at the calendar and say, no, we talked about this. You're okay. Mm -hmm. can can take a, yeah, you can, can take a day there. off to yeah. go yeah. and like and play I shoot them up with your friends. And you can <laughs> just walk into their room and just close their laptop and unplug it no. and take it with them. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can also take your clothes no. off when you do it. Not with my writer, you Not but once. And he has guns, so no. Yeah, he's not even with the right by arm. Yeah, never heard no, I just was saying, like, what's also really nice is having that open communication because sometimes they want to protect you because they feel the burden of everything. And I wish Mike was still in the room because I truly appreciate all that he takes on for our family to pay the bills. That's not even his first job. Writing is his second job. But um, one time I was like, this isn't okay. You are miserable, I am miserable, what is going on? He didn't want to let me know that a deadline changed. There was a translator that needed something sooner than it was, so he had to finish the end of the book. I didn't have any part of that. Well, if, you he, need to know. if he had told me just a week earlier that this had changed, the open communication could have saved a lot of sadness because I took it personally. I'm like, you're being, you know, what's up? And if he had known, it's safe to say to me, I messed up a deadline, or someone's expecting something sooner because he's on time all the time. And now I know, and he knows, all right, I do want to know because that, I'm like, oh. But also, yeah, okay, what Bridget was talking about, about, you know, dropping a phone or whatever, things can always be rescheduled. There's nothing yeah. in this life that's in concrete, okay? Not even getting out of this life that's in concrete except you know, to the higher authority. You can always say, okay, I'm, I'm not meeting my deadline. Let's reevaluate it. Go to the publisher, talk, you know, again, keep those communication lines open. You know, go to a con, I can't make it this year, can I be on your guest list next year? You know, for whatever reason. So we got seven minutes. You have a question? Yes. Okay. Um, how do you navigate, because I think most of you, your, your, your authors are uh, full-time authors, or, or mostly? Okay, so most of you, not all. Um, how do you navigate that? Yours could be, he just yeah. does yeah. yeah. I, I, I presume at some point you made that transition. So, okay, some of you. David, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to make that tr transition, yeah. but, the diff, but, the, but the bigger transition for us was uh, and she started writing 12 years ago, published 10. Um, and when we met, she she had five books out. Um, but it, it took, I don't know how many years it was, three years to do five books. And now she's doing sort of anywhere between seven and 10 a year. So she we leveled up with her productivity. Okay. Um, and that was, that was through working together. Yeah, what I was getting at was, you know, the, the, dealing with the fact that when you first start doing the full-time author thing, you might not be making enough to actually support the family, so you're going to be relying on your spouse for a steady income, for in, in the states here, you know, medical insurance and so forth. Um, well, you just sit down and do the math. You just sit down and do the math. At one point, I was really resistant to my husband stopping his job. It was a job he loved. You know, like the pay was really great, the benefits were really great, we were very comfortable, and he sat down and we did the math and he showed me the spreadsheet. Again, he was an accountant, <laughs> that was helpful. Mm -hmm. And it was, I need to get <coughs> this much. To make it viable. To make it viable, yeah. and I'm here. So, and then there was also a commitment of, okay, so how long do we go without it maybe reaching that level before we say okay pull we have plug. we yeah. have to like not not necessarily pull the plug but like we have to go back we have to take a step back and reevaluate and you need to go back full time or i need to go do something so Dave, david um he worked in in, in pr and and an advertising firm before he became became a writer uh he was married before uh his marriage had, had uh, fallen apart his wife had left and 
So he was he was in a transitional period, shall we say. Um, and he decided, you know, I'm, a, I'm starving right now because the, the, the advertising firm was owned by his parents. His, his dad had passed and things were not going well. And he said, you know, if I'm going to start doing something, I may as well start doing something I want. Mm -hmm. And so it was just him at that point. Um, so he made the transition and we never looked back. You know, and like I said, he was writing. He had sold the first book right before we met. Um, and then, uh, so like I said, I, I was aware of his writing before he had ever published the first book. Um, now, after the first couple of three years, you know, he, he never looked back. And another thing that David has never done traditionally was, you know, we never had an agent, we never had, you know, he shopped, he, he uh, was turned down by one publishing firm because the book was of a length they could not publish it. So he went, he went from Delray to, uh, to Bain and Bain published it in, in its entirety and we never looked back, so. Um, yeah, so it just no, depends on, on how, you know, because he was willing to it's throw himself into the deep end and go. So. Yeah, I mean, if you're asking for a way to make it less uncomfortable, yeah, it's, it's, gonna, be, it's, gonna be it's just not going to be a comfortable conversation. And there's still, there's but, still years where, you know, he, he fell in the, at DragonCon actually uh, four years, five, six, six years ago, um, and had a mass, massive concussion mm -hmm. and didn't really write for almost two years. And then he had uh, COVID in the beginning of 2020. He was in the hospital for 10 days. Um, so he, he you know, six, eight months that he didn't write after that. Well, and, you know, we have kids in college and we need the money coming in. So, yeah. That's, and another thing that's helpful is get your ducks in a row yeah, when you try and make the leap. I mean, if yeah. you've got $150,000 worth of credit card debt and Don't you're paying it. that down, like now is maybe not the time to make the leap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. my we were much we were younger. We'd only been married a year, and uh, no kids, and we hadn't bought a house yet. So you know he had reached a point in his job. I won't call it career. I think now this is career. His job where he had realized like I don't want the next promotion. I don't want my boss's job, and I'm not happy. What he didn't realize is he had that itch to get the stories out. I had a great advertising job, so he quit, let me know that he quit his job, cashed out his 401k, and said one way or another, I'm gonna make this work. Um, and he got like a part-time job um, in between, because he said, like, I can't sit for eight to 12 hours on a computer all day. He's not the sit down True. all day. He's, David he's, does it all the time. He's not the type to do that. So, you know, knowing himself and what would need in that movement and that exposure would help make him a better writer when he got back to the keyboard. Um, and we did that for about eight years. Well, I had moved up the ranks of my advertising job and we were kind of doing this thing where on the weekends and at night, I'm working on the business. I'm doing the ads, I'm managing the creative uh, uh, cover content, um, doing all of that stuff. And we had, were working on a series together even because, you know, why not do that with a full-time job and a two-year-old? Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> uh, You really need to do something. Yeah, I guess, what else could we do? <laughs> hmm. So uh, what we did there is we looked at the finances exactly, which is I'm risk adverse, he's all in, burn your boats, we'll figure it out. And I'm like, well, let's make a plan for boats. Let's save some of the wood, <laughs> and, you know, we can't the bowl, and let's just not, you know, burn the phone number so we can call back for help if we need it. Yeah. And but we made a plan because by that time, uh, we had a house in Orange County, California. We have a daughter. We have financial and other responsibilities. Um, and I wanted that comfort. And so we made that plan. And so I transitioned. Um, I did part time. And then from part time, I went to, uh, I left my job completely. And I transitioned to working on the business because I could spend more time working on the business. And the more time I spent working on the business, the better it could do. And the more he could do the writing. So it was a, a plusing situation. But you got to know where you guys are, what your priorities are, what your comfort levels are, and what your, your game plan is for your family. And if you're not there right now, it's okay. Yeah. Like, it's okay to not be there and mm -hmm. have to work to get to the place where you can. Like, that's fine. That's not very many people just decide and then make it happen the next day. So it's fine. Just make a plan and you'll be fine. But we don't have to leave our jobs. No, you don't have to leave your yeah, job. Yeah, I was, I was transitioning from what I was doing, advertising someone else's stuff to advertise our stuff, you know, so that works. And then I had some author clients as well at that time. 
And so, you know, it was, it's, it was different. But maybe someone's a nurse and she just wants to take care, or he wants to take care of patients or teach students or whatever it is that their own calling is, their career path doesn't have to be our career path. Um, and there are people they could hire, virtual assistants, advertisers, to help support that business. And we're out of time. But we will also, I will also be, if you have other questions. We'll be around. Like, you can ask. I'll be 